One of the most ancient constellations in the night sky is Ursa Major, or the Great Bear. And the tail of this Great Bear is called the Big Dipper. And of the seven stars that make up the Big Dipper, the one that makes up the bend of the handle is particularly interesting. Because if we take a closer look, we see that one star becomes two. And if we take an even closer look, we see that one of these stars themselves become two. So are there more? Let's find out. Guys, we're back with part two out of our 200-year-old astronomy book here, Geography of the Heavens. Give you guys a nice close look at the spine there. Nicely aged. So, anyways, tonight, part two out of four parts. Uh, part one was supernova and variable stars, two-parter. Part two tonight is uh, aptly binary stars. And part three is three and four. We might get to, actually. We might actually get to. It's going to be clusters, star clusters, stellar clusters, and nebulae. Of which we briefly touched upon in the last video. That uh, many were, in many of what we know today as galaxies are included. So... At least we're going to try to work through binaries in um, Geography of the Heavens. It's 1836 book, 184 years old as of 2020, by Elijah H. Burritt. By the way, I've noticed a slight uptick in the number of supporters for the channel lately on Patreon and PayPal. I just want to thank you guys, that's, it's huge, it's really generous, I don't want you guys to ever think any of it is ever taken for granted, so a huge thank you, I'm not really sure where it came from for any, maybe from any particular video, but uh, yeah, just thanks, it, it means a lot to me, so uh, I appreciate you, you like what I do, let's, now let's begin. symbol. Okay, so last time we did variable and double stars, or just variable and supernovae. Now we're doing binary, aka double stars, with some interesting surprises, as we'll find out. So when examining the stars with telescopes of considerable power, many of them are found to be composed of two or more stars, placed contiguous to each other, or of which the distance subtends a very minute angle. And subtending just means... Subten is just a term that astronomers use when speaking of distances um, in the night sky, distances between objects. Because as the Earth is a sphere, 
the night sky from horizon north to south or, you know, west to east, subtends an angle of 180 degrees, that's zero, that's 180. Generally when uh, you have two stars, just like the ancients used to think every star was on the same celestial sphere, same distance from the earth in the sky. So I, I suppose maybe that's a carryover, but subten just means the angle, refers to an angle between two objects that we can see, and we divide the sky anew, 180 degrees. Each of those degrees turns into a minute. So maybe up here, one degree equals 60 arc minutes. And then one minute, or I think it's seconds. That's the second symbol. One minute equals 60 arc seconds. So six, 60 arc minutes. Another way of writing that is with that dash apostrophe. Arc seconds. And another way of writing arc seconds is both dash is like a um, quotation. Yeah, from Latin subtendere, subtender, sub meaning under, tender meaning to stretch, extend, when we're looking up astronomy then we'll maybe control F the angle astronomy All right. oh <laughs> I'm on the Wiktionary wiki alright astronomy wikipedia Control F, subtend. Surely it's on this page. If not, yikes. Okay, we'll go to optical astronomy because there's many different types of ways, different sections of the electromagnetic spectrum that we that we view the heavens through. Control F, subtend here. Still nothing. Angle? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Alright. I'm going to go straight to the minute and second of arc. Here it says these units, the arc second, the arc, and the divisions by 60, generally, originated in Babylonian astronomy as sexagesimal, meaning a base 60 number system, sexagesimal, originating with the ancient Sumerians in the third millennium BC, five 5,000 years ago. That's so amazing. For measuring time angles and geographic coordinates. So it's used in uh, optometry, optics, navigation, land surveying, marksmanship, snipers, astronomy, for our case. But anything less than... So, anything less than... 
Okay, an arc second is just from there, if, if we're not converting into radians, which is a different form uh, using using pi essentially it's a it's a it's a unit of angular measurement like arc seconds but instead of degrees with a hexadecimal system space 60 system it uh, references pi where let's see one radian so one radian is 100 divided by pi, or 57 degrees, 57.296 degrees, so 180 degrees divided into 1 degree equaling 60 arc minutes, you can put it like, uh, write the units as the word or that apostrophe, and each arc minute is divided into further 60 units, they call them arc seconds. Easy to remember because they're just like time. And then from there we just do milli or micro, depending on how much further we want to divide the seconds. But yeah, radians, so that would be arcs, and then radians. is 180 divided by the number pi because there's essentially pi radians in 180 degrees or 2 pi radians in a full 360 degree circle so that equals about 57, because pi is a never-ending, never-repeating number. At least it's decimal places, so 57.296 degrees, about there. Should be 45, a little over 45 degrees. That would be about one radian and radians are essentially just used as a uh, mathematical convenience for for uh, physics alright so essentially he was saying that just by looking in the sky <laughs> very basic concept we we notice some stars with very large telescopes of considerable power. We can see as we zoom in one point of light, we notice one point of light becomes two, and sometimes even um, more, more than that. Even back then, they could see what he thought was three or trinary star systems sometimes. So appearance is probably, in many cases, owing solely to the optical effect of their position relative to the spectator. This appearance is probably, in many cases, owing solely to the optical effect of their position relative to the spectator. For it's evident that two stars will appear contiguous if they are placed nearly in the same line of vision, although although the real distance may be immeasurably great. And uh, we can see here we have a great example of Earth's perspective of the Orion Nebula, the, the main stars, or, or constellation rather that the nebula sits within, in the sword of that constellation. You can see that all this, the main stars are very, very far apart. So the constellation only appears like that because we, again, from our perspective, it looks as though 
all those stars are on a fixed sphere, a fixed, a, f a fixed distance away. There are, however, many instances in which the angle of the position of the two stars varies in such a manner as to indicate a revolution about each other and about a common center. In this case, they are said to be a form they in this in this case they are said to form a binary system. Oh, I, I forgot that. He actually used the word binary. Performing to each other the office of sun and planet and are connected together by laws of gravitation like those of which prevail in our solar system. So the recent observations of Sir John Herschel and Sir James South have established the truth of this significant fact beyond a doubt, beyond a doubt. Motions have been detected so rapid as to become measurable within very short periods of time. And at certain epochs, the satellite or feebler star, satellite being the general term for something that is a secondary unit of a system, you can have uh, even stores that are satellite stores. I used to work at, so I actually used to work at a uh, in high school boat dealership that had its main store in Fort Lauderdale. So. My secondary store was known as a satellite store. Okay, so we... They noticed that they were able to actually detect optically, visually, through a telescope by measuring very meticulously the, the difference in the angle. So if we blow this picture up, We're able to detect stars getting closer and closer, and maybe even occulting or eclipsing one another. And uh, and you can imagine the distances even if it's as far or as close as the Earth. The Earth takes an entire, you know, year to, to orbit. So you can imagine how fast that must be going around each other. If we uh, see two stars within, even with, within one human lifetime, that's still really, really rapid. So, it goes through phases as the sky is orbiting, you know, we can pretend we're seeing it from, maybe we see it from Earth like this, and so the orbit, um, again, because it's so far relative to us, we don't even notice any change in distance, even over you know, distances of millions and even billions of miles, light years even, we only, only at the scale of, you know, galaxies and very, very, very fast rotating stars and systems, we can then start to detect a redshift in which the actual wavelength of the light itself is stretched or compressed based on it coming the object that emits the light like a star or or maybe even a galaxy coming towards us or away from us especially at near even 10 percent the speed of light would be significant for us to be able to detect that redshift and uh, that's a whole nother story though with um, the actual fabric of space stretching and expanding so that it appears as though galaxies are moving through space but really 
the space between galaxies itself is stretching, which I I don't even understand that concept. But um, so we have you know a big star and a small star in orbit. And relative to us, if we are Earth, you know, millions of light years away, I just draw the Western Hemisphere here. If we're Earth, you know, looking at this system here, maybe, maybe we, uh, we see it like this. Let's see, how would we see it? So we have, in reality, the um, stars simply just moving around in its orbit around the other star but you know from us to us if we are looking directly at the plane so if we happen to just be looking at the stars orbiting say on this piece of paper here and it's going around this for simplicity's sake if we if we just pretend that the uh, one star is much more massive, this guy in the middle, so he doesn't move much. And then this one out here is much smaller. And so it's orbiting, and that's its plane of orbit. If we happen to be looking at it from here, even if it's, you know, billions of light years away, what we're going to see is keeping in the same plane. We're just going to see it's the angle it subtends. We're not going to see any orbital distance. And uh, if it's directly, you know, sometimes it might be at an angle like that, close to the plane, but not exactly on the plane. Sometimes it's directly on the plane, in which case, nowadays with our technology, we can even see planets that are directly on the plane if they pass in front of uh, their star and they're relatively nearby. We're, we're able to see the planets um, pass in front of their star, if not directly, indirectly by noticing the brightness dipping in the star. So, um, so yeah, as this planet orbits around, you can see it's um, pretty cool that it must either be really close together or orbiting at incredible velocities for us to be able to detect them visually over even, again, a lifetime, even 70 years. Sometimes these things take hundreds and hundreds and, and maybe even thousands of years to orbit one another depending on their distance and velocity and size and the gravitational pull that amounts from those characteristics. But uh, here we have an elaboration on that. And that's how they know that the stars are gravitationally bound because they can see them actually moving with very, very close attention. And when we're dealing with distances of, of light years, distances of trillions of miles, we, uh, it's amazing that we can detect motion at all, especially back then without any advanced electronics technology. So binary systems detected by John Herschel and James South have been, have established the truth of the singular fact beyond a doubt. Motions have been detected so rapid as to become measurable within very short periods of time. And at certain epochs, the satellite, the satellite 
of feebler stars has even been observed to disappear, which is when it eclipses, either passing behind or before, meaning in front of the primary star, or approaching so near to it that its light essentially becomes absorbed in that of the other. The most remarkable instance of a regular revolution of this sort is that of Mizar. So we're going back to Ursa Major in the Great Bear, the Great Bear, in the tail of the Great Bear. So that's the Big Dipper. So if we are drawing the just the tail part, the Big Dipper, we got... make some room here. The tail comes out, one goes down here. It's going to be this guy right here. And you can see the diagram here it shows you the the binary companion which is actually it's gravitationally bound but it's so far away in that you're gonna see a um, you you're not gonna see much motion much motion at all really The most remarkable instance of a regular revolution of this sort is that of Mizar, in which the angular motion is 6 degrees in 24 minutes of a great circle annually. Annually, so 6 degrees. That's 1 30th, 1 60th. It's amazing. 1 60th of a circle. So that's the angle that it subtends, which interestingly enough is roughly probably about what that is. If that's if this is 90 degrees from straight up to the zenith to the horizon right there. It's probably about 6 degrees right there maybe. do our little about sign there, which is amazing. So every year we notice a motion of 6 degrees, which would mean that it would take about 360 degrees. Well, no, no, sorry, that's, that's dumb math right there. Angular mo motion. So that um, eh, that would be if it was 6 degrees of the orbit, orbital arc, I guess we could say. That would be about 360 years, but it's 6 degrees from our perspective. So whatever that, the main, the actual large distance is, in which the angular motion is 6 degrees and 24 minutes of a great circle annually. So that means 6 degrees of its orbit, of a 360 degree orbit. So if that is 6 degrees out of 360 degree orbit, that's what he means by the great circle. Then that means that whatever we have to multiply that by whatever percent of the entire 360 degrees that that is will be about roughly the number of years it's going to take from us to orbit the star in, in our years. So we have, uh, that would just mean you know, 360 degrees divided by 6 degrees per year not 60, 
that's a degree symbol right there. It's going to be about 60 degrees. Um, <laughs> we did 6 degrees per year. Quick math that is equivalent. I always do. If you're dividing by a fraction, I always make uh, manipulate the equation to be multiplying by the inverse of this. So it would be 360 times one year per six degree. Gosh, I keep six degrees, not 60. Then the units of degrees cancel out. That's only a number one, so we just keep the units. And we have 360 divided by 6 is 60. Because 6 times 6 is 36. Add a zero on there. And we are left with 60 years. So, a 60 year orbit seems really fast for me unless the stars are really really close to one another let's see it says what does it say 58 and a quarter years yeah so that the two stars complete a revolution about one another in the space of 58 and a quarter years about 11 twelfths of a complete circuit have been already described since its discovery in 1781, the same year, in fact, that the planet Uranus, he calls it Herschel, here. Is it Uranus or Neptune? Herschel is Uranus. Initially, it was discovered by Herschel, so before they decided to maintain the Roman god theme amongst the planets, other than Earth, we, uh, we call it Herschel, apparently for a few years, or a few decades, actually, because this book was written in 1833. This version is from 1836, but I'm sure he hasn't rewrote that, so that would be about roughly 50, 48 years, so that lines up with 11 twelfths of a complete circuit already finished. So, let's see what we found out about Mr. Mazar here. And this is a... This guy right here. It's a well-known naked eye double star with the fainter star Alcor. Alcor. And is itself... Is itself a quadruple star system is that so the whole system lies about 83 light years away from the sun as we can see in this graph here 83 light years so galactically speaking it's uh it's pretty close it's pretty close to us so as measured by the Hipparchus astronomy astrometry satellite it's part of the Ursa major moving group so here's an example where we could see Alcor and Mizar separately if you have good seeing, good visibility, and good eyesight. But we could see that Mizar itself is four stars that make up a single naked eye star. It's amazing. So I don't even understand how that doesn't get excessively chaotic, you know, as it, as the orbits. Two, you could see. Four, three is maybe stable, but four seems, that seems just wild. Mizar is, so Mizar is a visual double with a separation of 14.4 arc seconds each of which is a spectroscopic binary. The two components, and this is kind of like the star we 
ended on Algol. Algol. Let's show you guys. I'll go here where you have two this is algo A with its own binary and then algo B has its own binary too you have AA and AB one and two so Mizar they got 14.4 arc seconds, each of which is a spectroscopic binary. So you have the spectroscopic binary, meaning they're only able to be detected spectroscopically, which is... Let's look that up. Sometimes an algo A and B are are the great example right here. Sometimes the only evidence of a binary star comes from the Doppler effect on its emitted light. So this is what we were talking about where you have the wavelength of the actual emitted light. If it's yellow, for instance, it's going to shift and become more red. If it's going away from us, the wavelength will stretch. Red is a longer wavelength than blue at the other end of the visible spectrum. So if, it, if it's coming towards us, it'll shift slightly, very, very, very slightly. It'll shift to blue. And, and you might wonder how we can actually measure that shift, if it's just a change in quality of color, you know, but... That's what's interesting about Newton. Newton's great discovery, um, well not discovery, but the science that of optics that was built off of Newton's realization that white light can be separated into all the colors of the rainbow and the visible spectrum in which, was it him? At one point after Newton's work on optics, so in the last few hundred years, we were able to determine that the reason light is split through a spectrum and the colors, individual colors of the white light become separated after passing through that medium of the prism is that the actual wavelengths of the light before it passed through their white light they were, they were, what's the word, what would you say, superimposed, I guess, on one another. They were all meshed together. The spectrum forced them um, to exhibit their characteristics of longer and shorter wavelengths, going from red to orange and yellow, and then, you know, green and purple ultimately blue purple being the shorter ones and so the deflection of light was greater or less depending on the wavelength and therefore as it went through the medium it separated and with the spectroscopic uh, spectroscopic lines the spectral lines that we talked about at the end of our uh, at the end of part 1 here you can see let me just bring an example up here. Shift. You can see a very subtle shift in the the known absorption lines or emission lines, depending on what it is. Um, so you have all these lines, and essentially, what it the best way to describe it is that it's a pattern of lines. Each element, each atoms because they have a different number of nucleons, uh, nuclear particles, 
they react to light differently, absorbing it, uh, absorbing different wavelengths of it. And we can recognize what type of elements they are based on their pattern. So the way spectral do Doppler shifts work is that elements have patterns, and groups of elements have groups of patterns of emission lines. So a star, a known star, you can see here um, a, an example of a pattern of emission lines. And they're very recognizable, just like a fingerprint, um, except they're not unique to each star because there's only a finite set of elements that are very common in stars. So um, there's a lot oftentimes repeating patterns. So what we can do is look at a known nearby star that has roughly the same elemental composition, chemical composition. If it's close enough, we can maybe use parallax to determine its distance. And especially, again, being close, oftentimes we actually have sophisticated instrumentation that we're able to use to determine its velocity. So by comparing a known object of a known luminosity and velocity, its known elemental composition based on its emission spectra, or absorption spectra, depending on whether it's a cloud or uh, a nebula or a star, we can compare further away spectra. And we can see, for instance, um, the galaxy here in this example. We can see that its spectra is shifting towards the blue because the separation between the individual lines is all the same. So. It's the same pattern, almost like a barcode, and but the whole code itself is shifted left, a little more blue. And so, if the if the template, just for example, I'm not really reading, so I don't know what they're trying to convey here, but if we just pretend the, I guess if we if we pretend that this star is the base baseline, I guess. Um, I, w I was originally looking up here, so let's pretend the star is the baseline. In that case, all of these other objects, the large galaxy, maybe a nebula, a small galaxy, and then like a tiny, 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 very distant galaxy. Yeah, and that's, that's what they are. A nearby, medium, and very, very distant galaxy. Maybe one of those ones that we see in Hubble's deep field, famous deep field image. You can see that all of these are shifted to the red end of the spectrum. They all share the same pattern, but they're, the barcodes are shifted. So, like this image up here shows, if an object, if we're on this side of the objects, in uh, relative to its direction of motion, its velocity, the wavelengths are going to be shortened. And if it's moving away from us, they'll be lengthened. And that same correlation maps on to the, uh, the emission spectra. So, it's super cool in that they we're able to analyze and observe the star in non-visible wavelengths and to be able to detect more faint, more subtle electromagnetic radiation. Here, this one's in the H-band, the infrared. So, this isn't visible. This is in, this is data gathered in infrared light says sometimes the only evidence comes from its Doppler effect. In these cases, the binary consists of a pair of stars where the spectral lines and the light emitted from each star shifts towards the blue at first and then towards the red. You can, uh, I visualize that as the actual orbit as we see here. So if we pretend it's coming towards us now and now going away, and now coming towards, 
As it comes towards, it will get blue, and away is red. So they notice a very sh subtle shift, depending on what side approaching or receding of the orbit it's on. And then it also remarks on the size of the system. In these systems, the separation between the stars is usually very small because they're gravitationally bound. In the orbital, at least, you know, at least for the ones that we can um, detect, because obviously the most detectable ones are going to be the quickest moving ones. Humans are really good at detecting movement, like most animals. Um, and so these systems that we're most likely to observe are going to be the most dynamic ones, the ones moving the fastest. So the orbital, that means the orbital velocity, the rate at which they orbit each other is very high. Unless the plane of the orbit happens to be perpendicular to the line of sight, the orbital velocities will have components in the line of sight and the observed radial velocity of the system will vary periodically. And since radial velocity can be, let me just clarify, radial velocity is the rate of change of the distance between the object and the point along its radius, its radial component, so when you have a, the object here. So we roughly draw a kind of oval shape here. The from here to here, let's say, as it orbits around this central star, <laughs> the distance, the radial distance. just the direct A to B line from star to star, uh, the radius, is going to shorten a little bit. So that might be R, and this might be R minus one astronomical unit, for instance. So the radial velocity is as it goes around how, how, how much its radius changes. A radial component. That's not very helpful. <laughs> God, that's like the <laughs> sm smallest Wikipedia image I've ever clicked on. Oh man, of course I. Radial velocity, come on. Alright. <laughs> there we go. Radial velocity. How about this one? Oh, it's going into exoplanets, but, uh, yeah, that's actually a pretty good visualization right there, I guess, of the, uh, I mean, you know, it's basic, but, yeah, it, it shows you roughly the stretching as it recedes and compression of the the wavelength. So yeah, they even telescopes with the highest resolving power, even today, can't make out a lot of these binaries as visual binaries. So they rely on the that very subtle shift of spectral lines and it doesn't, it takes l many days in years uh, of measurement sometimes to be able to detect the, the shift, the shift, 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 shift in line. So, 
with that tells us um, tells us that Mizar is a quad how do you say that there's four there's four stars <laughs> there's four stars in the Mizar system so there is two visual stars and each of those visual stars has its own detectable spectroscopic binary. The two components of Mizar A are both about 35 times as bright as the Sun and revolve around each other in about 20 days and 12 hours and 55 minutes if you want to be exact. It says in 1908 Mizar B was also found to be a spectroscopic binary. It's components completing an orbital period every six months. So these stars have to be very, very close to one another. In 1996, about almost 100, 107 years after their discovery, the components of Mizar A binary system were imaged in extremely high resolution using the Navy prototype optical inferometer. And here we have, let's see, let's check it out. Yeah, the Big Dipper, another picture. And we have a, a video from my star star map, what's it called? I forget the name of the program offhand, but uh, I'll put it in maybe. <laughs> you can see when you zoom into it, it's pretty cool and it shows you Alcor. Alcor is pretty far away and uh, Mizar A and B have their respective binaries, so it, they call it a quaternary I think, quinary, quinary system amazing. Okay. So that was... So here they're referencing Alcor. Alcor as Mizar's companion star, it's binary companion, but little did he know that the, the Mizar itself was resolved not only into Mizar A and B, but also <laughs> each of those components themselves were again resolved into binaries. Very, very interesting. It's amazing how populated the universe really seems once we peer into it deep enough gives me a lot of optimism for with, with, with just the amount of exoplanets that we're, we're finding a lot recently um, just really what the possibility of, of life is out there um, I, I get I get really excited when I when I think about it so a double star in Ophiuchus, Ophiuchus now presents a similar phenomenon, and the satellite has a motion in its orbit still more rapid, still more rapid. Castor in the Twins, Gamma Virginis, Zeta in the Crab, Z Buddhis, and Delta Serpentis, and our our featured star for this paragraph is. That remarkable double star 61 Cygni, together with several others amounting to 40 in number, exhibit the same evidence of a revolution about each other as about a common center. But it is to, remember, to be remembered that these are not the revolutions of bodies of a planetary nature around the solar center, but, but rather 
sun around sun. Each perhaps accompanied by its own train of planets and their satellites, their moons, closely shrouded from our view by the splendor of their respective suns, and then crowded into a space bearing hardly a greater portion space bearing hardly a greater proportion to the enormous interval which separates them than the distances of the satellites of our planets from their primaries bear to their distances from the sun itself. 61 Cygni first attracted the attention of astronomers when its large proper motion, and I'll define that below, was first demonstrated by Giuseppe Piazza in 1804. Then in 1838, Frederick Bessel measured its distance from Earth at about 10.4 light years, very close to the actual value of about 11.4 light years now known. This was the first distance estimated for any star other than the Sun, and the first star to have its stellar parallax measured, again meaning the, the motion. If we have our Earth, so when we have our Sun, our solar system, we got Mercury, Venus, and we have Earth goes around every six months. The Earth is on the opposite side of the Sun. And when you think about the Earth's orbit being about its 1 AU, and the definition of which is astronomical unit is about 93 million miles, so that distance right there. Earth the Sun we'll call 93 million miles million. Well when you double that being from one side all the way around that's double we get about 186 million miles and that's important because when you have nearby stars grossly <laughs> drawn grossly out of proportion here due to my cor corporeal small corporeal existence earthly existence we we have a bunch of much more distant stars in the background here so we have our view this star and we can see from this point of our orbit the stars way in the distance maybe let's say 20,000 light years we'll pretend that's the middle of the center of the Milky Way it's going to be to the left from our perspective from our perspective it's going to be to the left of this star and then from the other side of the orbit that creates the parallax because now we can determine that from this side six months later of Earth's orbit we've we've gone almost 200 million miles in space relative to this star so we've traveled just a little distance and when you you, know, you uh, close if you pretend you know, if you just hold your finger out at arm's length and close one eye and just alternate back and forth the finger looks like it's doing this relative to the further background and as we change sides in our orbit that's exactly what it looks like is happening to this star this star is our finger and it's moving it's moving from in January the 20,000 light year distant stars if we pretend this is you know 10 light years away these 20,000 light year stars 
from this line of sight look like they're to the left. And then from this line of sight in June or July, 200 million miles away from where we were initially looking at this star, 10 light years away, now these 20,000 light year distant stars seem to be on the right. And it's cool, you know, I've repeated this in multiple videos because, <laughs> mostly because I'm uh, a little too ignorant of, to, to go into anything in much more detail about astronomy, um, but it's a simple concept, I understand it, and I know you guys can too, it's, it's easy to draw, it's fun to explain because it's such a foundational part of our understanding, because we use actual parallax from stars, you know, tens of light years away, maybe maybe more distant than that. It might be up to a thousand light years or something. I have to verify that. Don't quote me on that. But that's how we actually measure what's called standard candles. And, and we talked about Cepheid variable stars in the last video, supernova and variable stars being a what's called a standard candle because they have a very predictable and very consistent variation between their luminosity and the their brightness and the quickness with which that brightness varies over time. So if that's time and this down here or up here, rather, is brightness. We measure in the star, and it fluctuates. It gets really dim, and then hits its peak of brightness, back to its valleys, and we measure spots in between, and we draw trend lines, and we recognize that after measuring enough of them, I mean, thousands, you know, astronomers are very, very astute in, in very patient and very detail-oriented observers and they measure thousands of them and they noticed a correlation that well the nearby ones we can tell how close they are through parallax we do is measure the angle we know that this is essentially so far away these ones we know that these ones are essentially infinitely far away for all practical purposes because they don't change with respect to any other background stars. They uh, they remain consistent with most of the other stars. So only the nearby stars are the only ones that we noticed a slight wobble. You know, if we have two patterns of stars, we'll, we'll do this. And then over years, we come back We'll pretend that's a little area of the sky. And we come back. And that same area now looks like this. Well, we know that that star has shifted very slightly to the left. And so what that means is if we look at it from this perspective, if these stars... It looks like this one shifted from to the left, but relative to all the other stars, these four stayed in a square-ish rectangular formation. That means they didn't shift. It was really this one that has shifted, which means that it looks like all these have shifted to the right, to the right. And based on our little pattern here, our little drawing, if it shifted to the right, goes from left to right, that must mean that it's this star that is closest. So that means we've shifted. So it'll look to us if our Earth has moved to, uh, you know, to the right, I guess, we can say. It'll, it'll look like the close star has moved to the left offset because the uh, 
the background stars are going to stay the same. So we'll um, so yeah, the uh, Cepheid variables, we know their distance through parallax, and we've measured enough of the close ones to determine that regardless of uh, distance, they actually seem to have the same correlation between brightness or luminosity and uh, speed at which they reach a certain brightness. So you might have you might have brighter ones getting brighter and dimmer quicker relative to less bright ones. So, um, and these are Cephean, forgive the handwriting, it's hard to write on a awkwardly held piece of paper. But these are Cephean variables here. So, 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 now if I can only figure out where, where I got off on that tangent from, uh, 61 Cygni was the first to be measured by parallax in 18, oh, 1838 by Friedrich Bessel, Friedrich Bessel, Friedrich Bessel and measured its distance from Earth to be about so it's roughly 11 light years away this was the first distance estimated for any other star than the Sun which is again how we measured the Sun's distance as well I believe probably would have had to do that during an eclipse so we could see some stars in the background among all other all stars or stellar systems listed in the modern Hipparchus catalog, 61 Cygni has the seventh highest proper motion in the highest among all visible stars in the system. So very quickly we can see this little diagram here is the proper motion is the so proper motion is essentially the apparent motion from Earth as we see it. Uh, pretty much what subtending an angle is. So because we don't know all these distance distances, you know, we see constellations and to us these constellations all look like they're on the same sphere, the same transparent crystal sphere uh, the same distance away from us you know if we if we didn't know any better back in the day before we had methods of rationally logically deducing and really you know having telescopes and things and um, being able to determine that based on certain characteristics the stars had to you know be different distances away from us it looks it appears, and that's what proper motion is, that the objects simply move along that same equidistant away from us celestial sphere. It looks like it's moving along that plane, that two-dimensional plane, way, way in the heavens. Um, this proper motion is an angle it subtends. But in reality, what it is, is the so we can see here the radial velocity, like we talked about earlier, which is, I guess in terms of us measuring it through a telescope and through, you know, our other spectrum metric instruments, instruments, we look at radial velocity as the uh, 
uh, component of motion that is either directly towards us or directly away from us. And that component adds with the transverse velocity, which is uh, that motion perpendicular to the radial component. velocity of stars stars man my handwriting's getting really self-conscious about it um, velocity of stars so if this again in a really um, proportional view uh, this is earth and we're you know looking out through a telescope the star's general motion it looks like it's it kinda looks like it's doing this and this right here would be the angle that it subtends I guess they call that mu the Greek letter mu um, so it's motion in reality though that's just it's kind of apparent motion it's proper motion to me that I guess it's maybe uh sometimes in physics they keep names that are uh, whose etymology is, is whose origin is it predates the more contemporary understanding of the thing that the name is trying to characterize so or, or label and so to me that's a counterintuitive name it's it's the improper motion really is what it should be but um, unless I'm misunderstanding it in which case if uh, if you'd like to please call me out in the comment section <laughs> but um, the real velocity as opposed to the apparent or kind of proper motion is the components the addition of the components of radial velocity and transverse transverse velocity and in physics a general reoccurring concept is that you take two components at 90 degrees to one another and you add them together so we map the transverse velocity will just uh, diagrammatically just for purposes of understanding this we map this onto the head of the end of the radial velocity vector the little line that kind of tells us the direction and magnitude of this component of motion radial the transverse velocity adds to that and you make this resultant vector well, I shouldn't go beyond it if we're going to maintain the analogy. But, yeah, the way they teach you in, you know, freshman physics, because I never took it in high school, is uh, you add the two vectors, and you get a resultant vector by um, A squared Pythagorean theorem plus C squared. So A is the square root of these square of these uh, the addition of the squares of the two components and that's the the resultant vector is the space velocity all right the space velocity um, in the proper motion <laughs> explaining all that is uh, it's just what we see from Earth, kind of the the motion uh, away or from or towards other objects on that celestial background. And apparently, sixty one Cygni is a is a binary star system in the con constellation uh, from which it gets its name, Cygnus, consisting of a pair of K-type dwarf stars that orbit 
each other in a period of about 659 years. So to me, that's a that's a much more realistic, uh, or I guess normal, paced orbit. It seems a 700-year orbit. It's much, much more uh, mild, mild-mannered, mild-mannered than uh, <laughs> than a 50-year orbit, which just seems, you know, incredibly fast. So. And then over the most modern features of 61 Cygni is that over the course of the 1900s, 20th century, several different astronomers reported evidence of a massive planet orbiting one of the two stars. But recent, oh, of course, they gotta let us out, let us down with a butt. Recent high precision radial velocity observations have shown that all such claims are unfounded. Oh man, what a what a bummer. Alright, well I'll leave this. I'll leave that in there anyway so you guys can see. Oh, awesome. Look at this diagram right here. Over how many years? You can see the actual proper motion of the binary system, so 2012 to 11 to November of, of 2019, so a seven year period. Man, look at that. That's cool. So here he has a little, kind of an aside about Sir William Herschel the the elder elder uh, Herschel of the two famous astronomers I guess I think John Herschel mentioned before looking at the uh, existence of binaries was was his son um, the examination of double stars was first oh no I lied was that his son let's see William Herschel died in 1822 born died resting place children John Herschel okay yeah Will, okay William Herschel was the elder Uranus and he was the discoverer of Uranus very cool Alright, uh, so William is the elder, John is the younger, and I guess William was the, um, was it John? No, so we talked about John, but John it himself was a polymath and great astronomer. So this excerpt says, it says the, the examination of double, st double stars was undertaken by the late Sir William Herschel, died in 1822. I guess John was still alive at the time of the, this writing, which is so... I keep forgetting how old this book really is. With a view to the question of parallax, his attention was, however, soon arrested by the new and unexpected phenomena which these bodies presented. Sir William observed them all in... all of them, in all... 2400 Sir James South and Herschel have given a catalog of 380 in the transactions of the Royal Society for 1824 and South added another 458 in 1826 John Herschel his son in addition to the above published an account of a thousand before he left England for the Cape of good hope, where he is at this time, <laughs> at the time of this writing, pushing his discoveries in the southern hemisphere with great perseverance and success. Professor 
Professor Struve with the Great Dorpat Telescope has given a catalog of 3,063 of the most remarkable of these stars. The objects of these, the object of these catalogs is not mere, merely to fix the place of the star within the search limits as will, as will enable us to easily discover it at any future time, but also to record a description of the appearance, position, and mutual distances of the individual stars composing the system in order that subsequent ob observers uh, may, of course, have the means of detecting their connected motions or any changes which they may exhibit. Professor Struve has also taken notice of 52 triple stars, among which number 11 of the unicorn, Zeta of Cancer, and Z of the balance, oh, the, like an actual balance scale, appear to be ternary systems in motion. Ternary. So I guess that's like trinary. Quadruple and even quintuple stars have likewise been observed, which also appear to revolve around a common center of gravity. In short, every region of the heavens furnishes examples of these curious phenomena. Very amazing. And so the section on binary stars here, double stars, ends with a subsection on the color of the stars, which is, as we know, uh, after talking about the spectra and um, all the other electromagnetic uh, portions of the spectra spectrum, all the other portions of the EM spectrum that we've observed stars through, we know that the, the color of stars is, is very, very important. Um, of course, a lot of, a lot of them in this this book were obscured by the atmosphere itself. Our Earth's fairly thick atmosphere. So it says many of the double stars exhibit the curious and beautiful phenomenon of contrasted colors or complementary complementary tints. In such instances, the, the large star is usually of a, a ruddy or orange hue, while the smaller one appears blue or green. Probably the virtue, probably in virtue uh, of that general law of optics, which provides that when the retina is under the influence of uh, excitement by any bright colored light, the feebler light, which seen alone would produce no sensation but that of whiteness maybe, shall for a time appear colored with a tint complementary to that of the brighter. Thus a yellow color predominating in the light of the brighter star. Oh, I, I, you're supposed to read that as, as if the word given is, is in front there. So thus, given that a yellow color predominating is, is predominating in the light of the brighter star, that of the less bright one in the same field of view will appear blue. While if the tint of the brighter star verge to a crimson, that of the other one will exhibit a tendency to green, or even appear a vivid green. The former contrast is beautifully exhibited in iota in Cancer, and the latter in Almac. And Andromeda, both fine double stars. And I looked up Iota and Almac. We could see here pretty awesome, uh, a very very cool picture. So he said the former is beautifully exhibited. The former contrast, being a yellow color, will make the less bright one appear blue. And you can see that's exactly exactly what we see here it's pretty amazing and uh, Iota Canceri, Canceri is a double star in the constellation of Cancer although no orbit has been derived the two stars show a large common proper motion 
so they're assumed to be gravitationally related. The brighter star Cancer A, Ida Iota Cancer A, is a uh, yellow G-type star with an apparent magnitude of plus 4.02. It's a mild barium star, slightly ionized barium detected. Meaning, uh, so that's a, uh, a great example of a star being, you know, having a very prominent element and therefore a prominent uh, associated emission spectrum or, absor or absorption spectrum that goes along with it. And we can look at the pattern of barium as we know it with, uh, um, with this star's pattern. We can see it's determined things about its radial motion, whether it's going away or towards us and at what speed by noticing the shift in that uh, spectral lines of barium in this star over a period of time, over how quickly will the spectra shift. So this, I really thought this part was very cool. So it's a mild barium star, slightly ionized, meaning it's uh, stripped, it's, it's not a neutrally charged barium array, I guess. It, it, it's defined by a more charged whether negative or leaning to uh, positive, having more electrons or less. Um, th that's what uh, it, it's characterized as. But it's thought to be formed by mass transfer of enriched material from an a asymptotic giant branch star onto an a, less, a less evolved companion. They, they haven't detected anything yet. No such donor has been detected in the iota ca cancer system, but the astronomers assume that there is an unseen white dwarf. So, they think that the the barium of it, I guess the, what they're able to detect from it is a, a telltale of a, a, a actual gravitational suction, a stripping of the iota cancery, the, the yellow star, stripping of it by a white dwarf, a much more dense, compact, gravitationally dominant, maybe, white dwarf. And then the fainter of the two visible stars, iota cancery B, is a white A-type main sequence dwarf with an apparent magnitude of quite a lot uh, dimmer of 6.57 relative to the uh, the yellow's 4.02 apparent magnitude. Cancer B, small blue component star, companion star, is a shell star surrounded by material expelled by its rapid rotation. And then the second one, the the example of so we got all Mac in Andromeda, where the first one there in, in in Iota, we would we saw the yellow being the predominant, more brighter 4.0 magnitude star, 4.02, making the normally just white dimmer star, by contrast, appear blue. The second one in Almac is going to make the brighter, the red-crimson hue of the brighter star is going to make the smaller one appear green. And did I find this one? That's right, so I I was confused because Almac turns out to be not only a a binary system, it's actually a quaternary system where 
the second of the apparent binary stars, the smaller star, is itself, itself orbited by a binary system. So you have A and what they call C now, or I guess B ends up being the, yeah, okay, so you have A and what we thought was just a singular second star, B. B ends up having being a binary system itself. So we have A, the main red crimson one, alpha, um, or rather A, gamma andromedae. So it's the gamma we can see here. If we pull up the gamma of the constellation Andromeda there, it's at the very top near the border of Cassiopeia to the top from uh, this one the top right of the Andromeda Nebula the M31 galaxy the system originally looked like it was two stars the real crimson one is an individual star but it's orbited by three stars we originally thought was one so B Gamma Andromeda turns into BA and BB, and then that itself is orbiting a third star C, Gamma Andromeda. So the, um, the part where the crimson star makes the other one look by the principle of complementary tints, contrasted colors, look green, I found one picture where it does when it's right next to it if you kind of you know squint you could see how it's gonna make it look green but the let's see but yeah as you zoom into the gamma I'm getting my, my names mixed up. The this this much more uh, high resolution image is of all Mac, which the whole system was initially considered to be all Mac, but uh, in seventeen seventy eight Johann Tobias Mayer discovered that Gamma Andromeda was actually a double star system, so so um, about 40 years, or no, 50, 50 years before this book was written, the, uh, we knew it was a binary system at least, but when we looked further into it, the red one, it's confusing because they alternately call it Gamma, gamma Andromeda A, or they s use a number system and call it 1 and 2 and 3, etc. So... Um, if we just stick with A, the ABC system, the crimson A was originally just thought to be orbited by the B, Andromeda B. B turns out to be, of course, itself a triple star system, a binary orbiting a much more kind of, a, as we can see here, a yellow and orange binary group orbiting a much more blue, uh, which I guess ends up being the more dominant color of the uh, Gamma C. So, what looked initially like a single star, then through a crude telescope, a double, a binary, ends up being a quadruple star system. I thought that was really, <laughs> just really cool. Again, opening up the complexities of the universe as we get more and more information we realize the life maybe not life in this example but we realize the universe is much more rich and complex and dynamic than we once thought and then the last bit so that was all Mac So if, however, the colored star be much less bright 
of the uh, of the two it won't materially affect the other so for instance Eta Cassiopeia which we're about to look at exhibits the beautiful combination of a large white star and a much small and a small one of a ruddy rich purple so a large white star and a small purple one and here we if we zoom all the way in I don't call <laughs> quite believe that's purple but uh, you can imagine how when you're looking through the atmosphere and through a you know a non-mechanically polished lens it's uh, it definitely might take on that appearance and again it's very interesting how our perception changes based on the environment so our perception isn't always a good judge of objective, uh, you know, facts, ob objective features of external objects a lot of times. I found out that, uh, so Eta Cassiopeia is a binary system in the northern circumpolar constellation Cassiopeia. Its binary nature was first discovered by the elder William Herschel in 1779. And based upon parallax measurements, the distance to this is now known to be about 20 light years from the sun. The two components are designated Eta Cassiopeia A, officially named Achard, Achard the tr traditional name of the uh, system. So we could see it Eta N. Eta, or sorry, Eta, 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 Eta. The N with a long tail is a uh, the Greek letter Eta. We could see it right there between Alpha. Is that Gamma or Lambda? Maybe. All right, and then. His last paragraph here, guys. Going to be slowly coming to our conclusion of binary, and it looks like this uh, this will end up being a four-part series. So that took a lot longer than I thought, but that's okay. We want to uh, we want to take our time, especially in this ancient book. Right, and then uh, it's not easy, he ends up saying, it's not easy to conceive what variety of illumination two suns, a red and a green, or a yellow and a blue, must afford to a planet revolving around either. And it's, to me, that's amazing to God. To, it, it's, it's cool on two levels, because primarily what he's saying is, is, is just a thing of beauty. It really is that almost like uh, Luke Skywalker on Tatooine looking at two suns, even though his were, you know, fairly basic compared to what we're talking about here on the color contrast. His was just, his was, uh, you know, Luke's was just white and kind of red, but that was also because it was at sunset, so suns set. <laughs> but, um, Yeah, I, I love that this guy makes it, he saturates his writing, and it's it's meant for a general audience, so it's very, it's very poetic, it's very, um, it kind of grips the reader with a, a sense of awe, and inspires us to not just absorb dry facts and numbers and patterns, but to look, you know, look for the 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 details look look at the dynamic like what what it actually means in in reality that th there might even be planets revolving around these binary systems in which they have two suns and their sky must be lit up in a different hue than ours it must be 
uh, casting a, a, a dark, dark crimson red, even at midday, or it's a a beautifully, um, you know, bright blue white, maybe, and then maybe even being next to it, if you have two suns in the sky, it might be a juxtaposition of that complementary type of colors, where you uh, you you might see one of the suns looking purple or or green, you know. <laughs> How amazing would that be? And then, and then on a you know a meta level, just it's amazing that this guy was thinking so science, uh, you know, so poetically and so I want to say like science fiction oriented, but uh, he was just thinking so imaginatively. And I love this writing. I love that he sparks wonder and. This was 200 years ago, and it's still something that captures our imagination. It's timeless, in other words. I love it. I love learning that our interests overlap and that we share passions and motivations and things that Things exist which inspire humans across centuries. And for being real, across millennia and tens and even hundreds of thousands of years. That feeling of of possibility that arises within us when we look to the heavens and think, what could we become if we ever could we achieve? How could we get there? What would it take? I wonder if it inspired us in some small way, maybe, to, to look forward and think optimistically about our future. And so he continues, what charming contrasts and grateful vicissitudes, a red and a green day, for instance, if they're alternating, alternating with white and with darkness, might arise from the presence of, or absence, of one or the other or both, above the horizon. Insulated stars of a red color, almost as deep as that of blood, occur in many parts of the heavens, but no green or blue star of any decided to you has, we believe, ever been noticed, unassociated with a companion brighter than itself. And there you have it, guys. The binary star system section of Geography of the Heavens by Elijah Barrett Part 1 of 4 or Part 2 of 4 <laughs> I will finish this one because uh, it's so to me it's so interesting I just I cannot get enough of this book it's so much fun um, I'll let you guys go I hope you enjoyed this thank you seriously for all of you who went out of your way to uh, support me on Patreon or uh, you know, send me support through PayPal, and um, just thank you for watching. Really, I uh, I look forward to your comments and criticisms. It's how I grow. It's how I grow. Take care, guys. We'll see you next time.